Well, the Bible is open now to Matthew 24. I want to continue our sermon series on the title, The Church is a Pillar on the Ground of Truth. And today we want to look up and um, understand the doctrine of eschatology, which is the study of the last things, the final events of this age. And they begin with the rapture of the church, followed by the seven years of tribulation, followed by the return of Christ to establish his kingdom upon this earth. And then after that thousand years, the new heaven, the new earth forever, world without end. Do not believe these folks who say that we're coming, we're, we're, we're at the end of the world. The world will never end. This age is coming to an end, and it's coming to an end very soon. But it will be world without end. Several times in the Bible, it says it, and I believe the Bible, from kiver to kiver, map to map, or from cowhide to map, and I believe it, everything in between it. And when it says world without end, you can count on it, world without end. You're going to hear that over the next few days. Now, on the night before Jesus was crucified, he made two prophetic promises to his disciples. And since those promises were recorded in the Scriptures, guess what? Those promises are made to us. Number one, Jesus promised not to leave them as orphans. He said he would ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit and to be their comforter, their counselor, their guide, the one who would be with them always, always be beside them, the one who would bring to their memory all the things he had taught them over the last three years, and the one who would empower them to accomplish the mission that he would soon be giving to them, and they did. In less than a hundred years, the gospel had spread from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world in that day. Now, that promise, uh, that promise was partially fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. We talked about that several Sundays ago when those 120 people who were gathered there in, in the upper room, some of them were the disciples, and the Holy Spirit came down and empowered them to preach the gospel in the languages of all the 30,000 people plus who had gathered there in Jerusalem for the annual observance of Pentecost. Now that promise is also partially fulfilled every time somebody is born again. They are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They are gifted by the Holy Spirit. They are enabled by the Holy Spirit to accomplish this assignment for which God saved them and will send them into the world, equip them and send them back into the world. By the way, in Ephesians 5, 18, the Apostle Paul says it's a command. We're commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And to be filled with the Holy Spirit in that passage means to be continuously filled. To be always filled with the Holy Spirit. But why would we have to be always filled with the Holy Spirit? Because we cannot do anything in the flesh. The only way a Christian can walk worthy of the gift of God's grace is to be totally surrendered unto and therefore completely empowered and therefore completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. A little picture came to my mind when I thought about that, about uh, throwing a little twig in the stream, you know, a little twig. And it kind of floats and rolls with the water. But the twig has no power of itself, and it cannot dictate where it's going to go. But it follows the flow of the water. And that's exactly who we are. When we're born again, we're the twig in the water. And we try to paddle our way. We try to find our way. And No, I want to go over here. No, 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 we're the twig in the water. And we're completely empowered and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And He will guide us into the places where He wants us to be. A Spirit-filled Christian, a Spirit-filled Christian, is not concerned, captivated at least, by the cares of this world, the flesh, the desires of this world. They're just not, it, I mean, they, they want a nice life. They like to have a comfortable life. But they're not interested in fame and fortune and trying to plan for the future. Rather, their one desire is to glorify Christ in all that they say and do. My desire every morning, get up and just glorify the Lord. How can I glorify the Lord? In every area of our life, we need how can we glorify the Lord today? and be used of God to draw others to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Because I'm telling you something, when that last elect is saved, when that last elect is born again, we're out of here. And so I would say to you, if you want to go to heaven, if you want the rapture to occur, get busy witnessing. And you may be the very one to lead that last person to the Lord. Wouldn't that be a great thing? All of a sudden you're shaking his hand, hello my brothers and sisters, and we're already up there. It's unbelievable to be that quick. Now, the second promise was in two parts. First, Jesus said he was going to prepare a place for us in the Father's house. And then a few days after that, after his resurrection, <clears throat> the disciples saw him ascend back into the heaven. The clouds took him up. As the, the Shekinah glory came and took him up there. And he seated there, as we said a moment ago in the pledge, or in the creed, that he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, where he's interceding for the likes of us. 
And second, though, at a predetermined time known only to the Father, he will return to this earth to rule and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords for a thousand years and again in the new heaven and the new earth forever. Seven years before he lands on planet earth again, Jesus will step out on the front porch of the Father's house and he will call for his bride to come forth. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. That event is called the rapture of the church. And while it is the next event on God's prophetic calendar, only God the Father knows when it will happen. That's why we say that rapture is an imminent moment. It's always imminent. And imminent does not mean immediate. It just means it can happen at any moment. The rapture is a silent, it is a signless event. It will happen without any warning, which is why we must always be ready always about the Father's business, always looking, our eyes look, looking toward heaven, and maybe even our ears now in these days pointed toward heaven to make sure that we're going to hear that shout. By the way, only the believers in Christ will hear it. Uh, the unbelievers won't hear it. The world won't hear it. Uh, they won't even recognize anything's going on in, until we're gone. Now, according to those who study such things, if the same level of tension that is in the world today, was in the life of a single human being, they would have already had a heart attack. Now, let, let me kind of put that in a way you can understand it. Let's just say that let's just say the 100% tension would mean, I mean, you're, just, you're, you're, you're wired. So 75% tension would be, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm almost wired. And I think all of us could say that the world right now is about as tense as we've ever seen it in our lifetime. Would you agree with that? Now, that means if everybody walked around today, if, if, if one human being could embody this amount of tension, there'd be stroke level or heart, heart attack level. And yet, the level of anxiety continues to grow, continues to increase, and people are just waiting, just waiting for that next global event to happen, and they wonder how that next global event's going to change their lives. How many would say that's where you are right now? You're living in that tension of what's going to happen in the future. The major nations of the world taught us with their threats of World War III. And the war between Israel and Iran may very well be the lead up to those final wars of Ezekiel 37, 38. They kick it off anyway. And this war is not over. It's sort of lulled down to a peaceful storm. But uh, it's not over yet. There will be some other things happening in a few days. There's an anxiousness about the strange weather patterns, the phenomenal increase in the number and magnitude of earthquakes, the floods, famines, and the new pestilences and diseases for which we have no known cure. By the way, Dubai got uh, a year's worth of water in, in less than two hours the other day. They, they have, and the water has no place to go. It's unexplainable. There were some jet streams uh, north of them for a little while, and they might be blaming it on that. But they'll find some way to blame it on Christians. You just wait and see. America, though, America's one election away from anarchy. Would you agree with that today? If we're not, I think we're already there, but um, that's just my opinion. But listen, we're divided politically. We're divided politically like we've never been divided before. I think even the Civil War was not this bad. We're in debt economically. I think the number is $34 trillion, uh, And they added, I mean, how many billions yesterday to it? Uh, there's no way in the world this will ever get paid off. You understand that. They'll have to wipe the books clean some way, and they'll do that with a war. Uh, we are vulnerable militarily. We have some military people here. We have former military people here. And the, I think the consensus of opinion is if we were to get into a two-front war today, we'd be in deep trouble. We're debased morally. And uh, I, I mean that, that's, a, that's the cleanest word I could use to, de to describe the debauchery and the, and, and the hatefulness and the wickedness that's in the world today. We're debased. And then we're weak spiritually. And by every measure, by every report, we are weaker spiritually today than we've ever been in any generation before us. And if I get a little caustic sometimes, if I get a little anxious sometimes, maybe get a little, get a little forceful in my words, it's because I'm trying to wake us up. I'm trying to wake parents up to realize you best get your kids in the study of God's Word. And not only here, but you better get it at home. They, we're, we're out of this world in a few years. They have to live here. And we better start equipping them to live here in faith and not in fear. 
And that's our job. We can't clean up the world out there, but our job is to pre prepare them to live in the sewer that's coming. And you better be able to do that. And that is your primary, primary, one more time, primary responsibility. If they can count two plus two, that would be an advantage, but they better know the Lord for sure. So we ask, we ask ourselves some very serious questions. As we look at the world today, are these the normal events of a chaotic and confused world that's kind of gone off the rails? Maybe it will take another world war to kind of reset us back to some semblance of sanity and humility. Or are these the normal events of a society that's rejected God and like all the other nations and headed towards self-destruction like Greece and Rome and, and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and all the others that have fallen by the wayside, they imploded. Nobody came in and attacked them and destroyed them. They simply imploded b because of the weight of sin. Or is this God's way of awakening Christians who are, who are prophetically asleep and uh, rousing those Christians who have become spiritually deaf, including many of those who will fill the pews of the churches today, but contrary to the scoffers, even in the pulpits, Jesus said his, he's not changed his mind. He still loves the church. The date of our marriage is still set in the mind of God, in the Father's mind. And very soon he's going to descend from heaven with a shout and call his bride to come forth. And I'm telling you, not many people are preparing for that. Not many believers, are from, not many believers believe that. The, 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 the numbers are astounding. And beloved, biblical prophecy is happening right before our eyes every moment of every day. But sadly, only a small few who claim to be saved could understand just the biblical prophecy that I have preached already this morning. They don't understand the big picture of biblical prophecy because we're afraid to preach it, we're afraid to teach it. You better because we're living it and we're seeing the end of it right now. Now the text before us in Matthew 24 is called the Olivet Discourse simply because he was on the Mount of Olives when he taught it. But it is also called the Little Apocalypse because in this passage, Jesus, not some author, not some church father down the road, Jesus gave his disciples and now us the actual sequence of events of the last days of the church age including, and uh, by the way, all the way up to and including his physical return. But the main thing is uh, that I want you to understand here, this is not really an apostle, it's not really one of the gospels. No, this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is not added to the scriptures. This is the scripture. Jesus wanted his disciples to know he was coming again to finish the job that he started when he left. He's got, what has he got to do? Well, he's got to rid this world, he's got to rid this earth of the curse of sin. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when there's no sin anymore? And he's going to restore it back to the Garden of Eden. Almost when he sets his feet back down on terra firma, this whole earth is going to change. And it's going to be restored over time back to the Garden of Eden. And Jesus said certain events will begin to happen on earth. And then over time, those events will happen together. And then over time, they will happen faster and faster with more intensity. And Jesus said, the generation that saw all these certain events happen again and again, and then they all happen at the same time, and the increase in their rapidity and their intensity, he said, that generation that sees all this will know that they are in the season of the end of the age. And here's what he said. I'm just telling you what the Lord said. He says, those in that generation, some in that generation, will see, will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. Now that's true. That's, the, that's what the Word of God says. I'm not a fear monger. I'm not a prophecy preacher. I'm not an alarmist, or nor am I an extremist, especially when it comes to the preaching of the Word of God. I know this. I, I preach every sermon looking into the face of the one who called me to preach and the one to whom I will give an account of every word I preach. <laughs> However, as a pastor, I am also a Watchman, and according to Ezekiel 33, here's the watchman's call. If I see a prophetical, uh, prophetical storm cloud gathering, and I don't warn you about it, the Lord's going to hold me responsible for any harm that you endure. But if I see those things happening, and I tell you, and I warn you, and I warn you, and I warn you, and you don't do anything about it, then not only are you responsible for any harm that comes to you, listen, dads, you are responsible for any harm that comes to those under you because you've been warned. If our families must live in this wicked world, husbands and fathers need to stand up 
Man up, if you will, if you have the courage. Man up and be the, certain, be the watchman on the wall God has called you to be in your homes, in your workplace, in your communities, and even in this church. And God's going to hold every one of you accountable to that. I'm telling you, you have been warned. You have been officially warned. So mark this date down in your Bible. What is today, uh, the 21st or whatever it is? Mark it down in your Bible. Because uh, mark it right down by Matthew 24. Because here's what I want you to know. From what I've learned from the Scriptures over the last 50 years, and from what I see happening all over the world, and many of you will conclude, many of you will agree with me, I am officially warning you today, the king is coming soon, and I urge you, get prepared. You have been officially warned. Beloved, this very day could be the day, the dawn of a new day in history, as the Lord calls his bride to come forth. This could, it could have happened before I eat that casserole mama's got in the oven today. According to the prophecy of watchmen in whom I trust, President Biden's actions against Israel over the last few weeks just move the end time prophecy clock as you see on the front of your order of service there, front of your study guide. It moved those hands ahead by several minutes. For the Bible says in the last days the nations of the world will turn against Israel and our president turned against Israel. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3, God said he would make Jerusalem a stumbling stone for the people of the world, so much so that all the nations of the world will turn against it, and we're seeing that happening right now before our very eyes. The nations of the world think they can solve the problem between the Arabs and the Jews by dividing the land of Israel. Better not touch that. Best not touch that. I'm telling you, throughout the Bible, the nation of Israel has always been God's timepiece. And uh, it will be no different as we go into the final days of this age. But why? Because it's all about the nation of Israel. You don't understand that. What began in the Old Testament will end in the New Testament. And the eyes of the world will be focused upon that tiny little piece of land of what they call Israel. The focus of the whole world will be upon Israel. For that's why. Why would it be upon Israel? For that's where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. Do you know, now understand why it's so, it, it's so argument about today, about that land. That's the land that, where Jesus is going to return. The leaders of the world think if they can just divide the land of Israel between the Arabs and the Jews, oh, we can have a two-state solution. There will be peace. Well, they've been divided now for many, many years. Has there been peace? Not at all. However, the Bible is very clear. No one, no one, no president, no UN, no one has the right to divide the land God gave to the Jews. Beloved, but, but listen to me. The Jews don't occupy that land. They own the land. It's their land from radiator camp to tailpipe. It's always there from the north to the south. They don't occupy it. They own it. They have a title deed to it, and it's signed by the one who created it, the one who chose it, and the one who gave it to him. The truth is, God has made it clear. Those nations that try to force Israel off the land will answer to him. And beloved, they are answering. So have we arrived at that prophetic point in history where the entire world is turning against Israel? Well, they had a, the other day the United States uh, did not vote to, uh, in order to make a two-state solution there to declare Palestine a state, but about 19 of the nations did. And so we're reaching that point. We're not, we're not there yet, but we're reaching that point, and it could happen at any moment. So let me kind of calm down now. In Matthew 24, verse 3, the disciples asked Jesus two questions. When will these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? But rather than rebuking them or scolding them for asking questions that's beyond their pay grade to know, Jesus answered their questions, but in reverse order. Watch it now, verse 36. Jesus said, but of that day, <laughs> end of that hour, uh, it's not for you to know. That's the bottom line. Okay, so he answered their questions with, with another statement. You don't know that, and you're not going to know that. Only my Father in heaven knows that. So underscore that. No man knows. You can buy all the prophecy books that you want to buy, but nobody knows when it's going to happen except the Father alone, okay? Others will come up with their formulas of dates and so forth, but it's only speculation, and I understand that. But... Uh, uh, but not, not only does no human know, no human can know. Only the Father in heaven knows. Now many thought the solar eclipse the other day might have been the way that 
God's going to take us out of the rapture. And quite frankly, I kept looking up, hoping it would come true. But, uh, but it didn't happen. And here's what they said. Now, watch this. Be careful. They said, because the Bible says in the last days it's going to be the darkening of the sun. Well, you've got to know your biblical prophecy and where that happens. But over the darkening of the sun does not come until the right at the end of the tribulation. So they were thinking this is the end of the tribulation. This has been a Sunday school picnic compared to what's coming in the tribulation. So you need to know your prophetic timeline. Now, as I said, the rapture of the church is a signless, soundless event. The world will neither see nor hear. That is until they find us gone and uh, they're left behind to kind of wonder what in the world happened to those folks. Now, the bookmark that we gave you this morning, I want you to take that out just for a moment. You notice that the we are where we are on that bookmark. And uh, if you turn it right, you can see the cross over here. Okay, after the cross, between the cross and that first area going up is where we are. That's the New Testament church area. Y'all with me on that? Say amen. amen. All right, so the next event then is the rapture of the church. Then comes the emergence of a new world leader called the Antichrist whom I believe is in the wings today, just waiting for the right moment. And he will usher in the tribulation. Three and a half years later, it turns into the great tribulation. I'll tell you why in the midst of the sermon today. So the tribulation starts with the rise of the Antichrist, and it ends with the physical return of the Christ. In the middle of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will enter the new temple, desecrate the altar, declare himself to be God, demand to be worshipped as God, which includes the... Uh, the mark of the beast. And three and a half years later, Jesus will return to earth with his bride, destroy those evil powers, uh, Satan and the beast and the false prophet, and establish his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years, and will reign with him for a thousand years. We'll be spiritual beings. Understand that there will be human beings on the earth who in some way, shape, form, or fashion survive the tribulation and walk into the into the millennial kingdom as human beings, and they will, they will also bear children and so forth. The population will be much more at the end of that thousand years than it is today. But we will be here as spiritual beings as Christ was when he was resurrected. Now let me encourage you to share this outline with your family and share it again and again. Share it with your friends. For while they may not want to hear it today, they may not believe you today, they will be reminded of what you've told them on the day that they find you missing. Oh, where is that little chart they talk? What, where, where is this thing? And they will find it. I know some folks are in here this morning have written pamphlets, and they put it in their house, in the food pantry, in other places, even in the freezer and the refrigerator. Uh, we're gone, and here, here we, 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 you know, we, and we ain't coming back. We're gone to the rapture. But here's what you can have. If the mayonnaise is blue on top, you might not want to use it. But I'm just, they're, they're, leaving, they're leaving notes in their home to those who will take over their house when they leave for the rapture. Amen. Now look at Matthew chapter 24 and identify some things here that tell us that we're in the season of the Lord's return. Ready? The first sign Jesus said would be apostasy. Now I'm going to spend a, a little bit more time on this than the others. The word apostasy describes those who, after claiming to be Christians for so many years, turn away from the true faith, and they embrace the lie. They become victims of Satan's deception. Verse 4, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and will deceive many. We have many of those out there today already. On the eve of the 20th century, when it seemed like Christianity was going to take over the world and spread throughout the world, William Booth, the man who founded the Salvation Army, predicted that by the end of the 20th century, the gospel would be forgotten within the mainline denominations. Did you hear that? Booth said by the end of the 20th century, the mainline denominations would act as though they'd forgotten what the Bible says. They would be preaching Christianity without Christ. They would be preaching forgiveness without repentance. They would be preaching salvation without regeneration. They would be preaching Heaven without hell, folks, that's exactly where we are in the majority, if not all, of the mainline denominations today. That's where we are. The church has suffered a dramatic decline in membership in the 20th century, and that decline continues today. They do not know how to stop it. They have no other weapons in their arsenal of, of gimmicks to try to get people to come. 
And more importantly, during the same period of time, there was a deliberate departure from the historic faith, meaning that body of doctrines that we read this morning in the Creed, that body of doctrines that was handed down from the Lord Jesus Christ to the apostles, codified in the English language and handed down to the church fathers and now to us. That's apostasy. When you turn from the faith that was once handed down from the saints, that is apostasy. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the apostle Paul said this, those who feared they had missed the rapture. He said, no, 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 no. You, the rapture has not happened yet. He said, let no one deceive you by any means. For none of the events of the day of the Lord, beginning with the rapture and going all the way to his friend, none of those events will, will come unless and until there is a falling away first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So the apostasy comes, and the people turn away from the faith, and then that uh, Antichrist will rise. Now, we will not know who the Antichrist is. We may suspect who it might be. We might have some indications, and because we can look back and think um, his biology or his, his, uh, all, all of his, uh, his history and so forth, but we will never know who it is because we can't, so we, he can't be here while we're here. Now, in the major mega churches today, the preaching of God's Word has been reduced down to asking God, would you be our life coach now and come and help us overcome our inadequacies that we might have our best life on earth today? That is the gospel presentation in the majority of churches today. God, you'll be our life coach. Their formula of salvation requires no repentance, no sacrifice, no surrender, no submission. It's a Christless Christianity, just like William Booth said. And as a result of this heretical teaching, only 4% percent of Americans have a biblical worldview. You want to know why it's so bad out there? It's because it's so weak in here. Only 9% of those who claim to be born again believers have a biblical worldview. Only 37% of the pastors have a biblical worldview. Only 2% of today's youth are involved in anybody's church. Less than 10% of those who are in church today haven't even heard the term born again, much less understand it. As many as 5 million youth and young adults, 18 to 25, are involved in more than 2,500 cults. And their numbers are growing more and more every day. Why? They're turning to spiritualism because they have rejected the truth. You see, when we reject the truth of the God's Word, we don't worship nothing, we worship everything. And they're turning to everything today rather than turning to God. Now, in preparing this sermon, I... I found an interesting report from the Barna Research Group. I don't normally read these things, but I want to read a couple of paragraphs because parents, please, 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 grandparents, please, 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 listen up, I guess, uh, just a few seconds here. This was an exit interview with teenagers. Here's what they revealed, that by the spiritual foundation laid by the families and the churches when they were younger is inadequate. Few teens said they learned enough Bible content to enable them to make important decisions uh, based upon biblical principles. In other words, when it came down to decisions of life, uh, the first place they went to in order to find direction was not the Word of God. Why? Because that foundation was not laid for them by their parents and by pastors and churches. So the moral foundations of children are solidified by the age of nine. The moral foundations of the children are solidified by the age of nine including their choice regarding their faith, their relationship with Jesus Christ. And by age 13, most teenagers have already made up their minds that when they get free from their parents, they're going to abandon the church, and over 80% of them will, with less than 10% of them ever returning back to the point that they were when they're children. Now you understand why I get aggravated a little bit? You say yes or no. I'm like a grandfather about this. We're not coming through, folks. You're not getting it. The bell ain't ringing. The church can't counter 15,000 hours of public school indoctrination with a few hours of Sunday school every week when your kids aren't there half the time. And you expect us to overcome it? This is not a dry cleaners. You can't bring your kids in dirty and, and pick them up an hour later when they're clean. That doesn't work that way. According to the latest report from George Barna, the American church is losing members so fast they don't know what, that they can't count them all. 
It began some 50 years ago when ch the church abandoned the Bible as the only authoritative source for the foundation of our faith and the practice of our faith and the application of our faith. The church turned to entertainment-based worship and prosperity gospel preaching and self-help groups to attract attendance and keep the people coming. Folks, hear me, it hasn't worked. It won't work. Here we are 50 years later, and the number of American people even calling themselves Christians is down from 91% just about 10 years ago to 82% today. And the church membership is down 73 to 66 with only half of those claiming church membership actually attending church one Sunday a month. And despite the increasing numbers of mega churches and TV churches all over the world, the number of Protestants and Catholics in America have declined about to, uh, to 19%. So you don't know why it's so bad out there? It's because it's so bad in here. We must be sure that Jesus we worship and the Jesus we serve and the Jesus we follow, and the Jesus we believe in, and the Jesus we say we're looking for <laughs> is the Jesus of the Bible. But I'm telling you, not everybody that says Jesus is understanding the Jesus that you and I read about today. Because there are many, 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 many people today who are following the Jesus of their own imagination. Not the Jesus of the Bible. They're following great signs. They're following great wonders. They're following, seeking great feelings, and they're following great movements. Because they think that's where Jesus is. They see the crowd over here around some religious. Event. Oh, that's where Jesus is. All these new startup revivals and so forth. Like, and some of the colleges and universities. Some of it may be real. But understand, God doesn't always work like that in a crowd. Think about it both of the scripture. They're being deceived. They're following after a false concept of God and a false concept of revival. That's the same as following a false Christ. And they'll worship that false concept of Christ on the day that we're gone. Well, what happened to them? We worship Christ too. Why aren't we gone? Because they did not believe nor accept the Jesus of the Bible. They accepted the Jesus of their preacher, their Jesus of their movement, but not the Jesus of the Scriptures. Now, as a pastor, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be responsible for anybody's deception, which is why I'm doing everything I can to protect my flock from that. But today's parents need to know that they too will be held responsible for their children's spiritual welfare. You've got them clothed, you've got them fed, you've got them shoed, you've got them schooled, etc. Great. How about their heart with the Lord? Have you thought about that today? Have you thought about your children's heart for God? Jesus said the second sign of his imminent return would be the international terror. Look in verse 6. Wars and rumors of wars. Here we go. Pick up, by the way, pick up one of the a news things on that way out the legal report break your heart but it seems to me that we now have people in leadership positions all over in every leadership position from from international to national to state and local who know what nothing but war and war and more war if we could look at the globe today if there was a light burning in every place where there's an active conflict 70 something lights would be on out of the 200 nations war subsides in one, one day in one area, but it explodes the next day in another area. But Jesus said just before he returned, which is why we say it's near, the battles of war will get closer and closer. The destruction of war will become greater and greater. There will be a constant talk of war as the oral, oral uh, conflicts, they increase in their number and in their intensity until it is all out world war. World leaders are arming themselves today for war like never before, and most of them have their sights set on one little bit of nation called Israel. But Jesus said not to be troubled about these behind, because all these wars have to happen, they have to come to pass, in order to bring about that war that will end all wars, or at least begin to end all wars, it's called the Battle of Armageddon. And we see the very nations lining up. Even yesterday, Russia was talking to Turkey. Turkey was talking to Iran. Iran was talking to all their proxies. And we're getting ready for the Ezekiel 38, Magog, Gog, Magog war. Don't, don't think it's all over. It's not. The third sign is international poverty. Verse 7, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. <coughs> Records show between 1900 and 1995, there were less than 135 Earthquakes with magnitude of 7.0 and higher. In 2023 alone, this last year, there were more than 15,000 earthquakes, including 19 of a magnitude of 7.0 and higher. 
Worldwide weather patterns are being described as strange, as all of the weather reporters can say. What, what a strange thing this is. Record-breaking weather in every part of the country over the last 12 months. Things like they've never seen before. The World Meteorological Organization said this, new record extremes occur every year somewhere in the world, but in recent years the number of such extremes has been increasing. Nearly 10% of the world's population today is affected by hunger. 10%. Uh, that's 780 million people, and you ready for this, children? 60% of that 780 million are boys and girls. 50 years ago, doctors were confident they had the cure for every disease, but today scientists are warning uh, of these new diseases on the horizon for which there are no known cure, and if there aren't any, they'll make them, and they'll make sure that they kill us. In verse 9, we'll see the next sign, the persecution of Christians. Then they will deliver you up to the tribulation, kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for not my name's sake. Two-thirds of the Jews who are alive at the very beginning of the tribulation right there will not be alive by the mid of the tribulation. And the Jews and the Christians who refuse to take the mark of the beast, they'll be killed immediately if they're not hunted down. The Antichrist tries to wipe God's people off of the earth before Jesus returns to set up his kingdom. That's happening today. But remember, what's going to happen in greater intensity there in that particular period of time is going to begin here today. So here's why we're saying 360, according to the world of martyrs, uh, 365 million Christians are being subjected to higher levels of persecution and discrimination today. 365 million. That's risen 20 million per year since, since 2021. We don't hear about it. You think the media is going to tell you about that? Absolutely not. Well, we don't matter. Christians are being tortured, they're being beaten, they're being starved, they're being separated from their families, they're being sold into slavery in many countries, not only physical slavery, but sexual slavery. And today the governments, including the United States, will not say a word about it. There is a slave labor in China that has some of our brothers and sisters working in it today. And if you buy certain things from a certain part of this made in a certain part of China, then you're helping to sponsor those who are living in those work labor camps. The last event of the first half of the tribulation is world evangelization. Some of you have been concerned about this. Look at verse 14. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Now, despite the deception of false Christ and the false teachers and despite the warfare and pestilence and the disasters and despite the persecution and the martyrdom of those who receive Christ as their Savior and Lord, and despite the defection of false believers, the gospel of the kingdom of God will continue to be proclaimed throughout the whole world, even during the first half of the tribulation. Massive, massive revival, massive, massive evan evangelistic crusade. God will supernaturally present the gospel to every person on earth. He will send 144,000 Jews to preach the gospel to every corner of the world. He will send two witnesses to prophesy to the world. They'll kill them, but they come back to life. You just can't kill those folks. He will send angels to preach to every nation, every tribe, every language, and every person on earth. This will be the final and the total evangelization of the world as God closes the door of salvation forever. So don't worry about, necessarily worry about those who can be left behind. They will have an opportunity, but I promise you the opportunity to receive Christ will also be the opportunity to be killed. Matthew 24, 15, Jesus said, Those who are alive in midpoint of the tribulation will see the abomination of desolation. What does that mean? Well, it's an event so wicked and so vile that it will shake the Jews into reality to let them see how they have been deceived by the Antichrist. And as you know, a remnant of them will escape to a place called Petra where they will be there for three and a half years. At the beginning of the tribulation, here's what starts it. A peace treaty. Well, lo and behold, how many nations are trying to get a peace treaty with Israel and the Arabs today? At the beginning of the tribulation, the Antichrist will make a seven-year peace treaty covenant to protect Israel as a nation, let them rebuild their temple, let them return to their sacrifices, beginning with the four heifers, and let them reinstate, every, reinstate all they had before A.D. 70. However, three and a half years into the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to turn. He's going to enter that temple. He's going to remove every semblance of God. He's going to put up every semblance of himself. 
and demand to be worshipped as God. And in order to do that, you have to have the mark of the beast. Now, that's where the mark of the beast comes. We're going to see some precursors to that in the identity uh, machinery over the next few years or ever how long time lasts, but that's not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast cannot come until mid-tribulation. Those who do not worship the image of the beast or those who do not um, take the mark of the beast will suffer the wrath of the Antichrist. But listen to me carefully. Please make this note on those that you can leave behind for your, for your house. Those who do worship the image of the beast, those who do take the mark of the beast, will answer to the wrath of God forever. That will close their door to salvation forever and forever. Why? Because you've made your decision. You're going to worship the Antichrist. Matthew 24, 15 to 22, Jesus told the Jews, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, as described in Daniel, standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetops, don't go down and take anything. Don't get your clothes. Let him who is in the field, don't go back and get your clothes now. But woe to those who are pregnant, because you're going to have to do some running here. And those who are nursing babies, and those days that, you know, that's all they had to do, pray your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for there will be a great tribulation. Such has never been before unto the beginning of the world, nor shall it ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect saved, those days will be shortened. So the escape of the Jews is pictured here as that woman fleeing into the wilderness, a picture of, of the Jews here, and where God protects and provides them. The King James says a time, time, and a half time. It means three and a half years, or 42 lunar months, if you will, or 1,260 days. You'll see that all over. However, while those who refuse to bow before the Antichrist will be hunted down and martyred, they will also be rewarded in heaven. Let me give you the picture of that. John saw it. Revelation 15. Don't turn there, but listen. John said he saw those who'd been victorious over the beast. How were they victorious over the beast? They said, uh-uh, I'm not taking it. You can take my head, but I'm not going to bow before you. And he says they'd, be, they'd rather be willing to die than to bow before the Antichrist. You know where they were? John said he saw them standing beside the sea of glass, glowing with fire, and they were holding harps, and they were singing glory unto the Lord. Wait, amen. Now, for seven years, the Antichrist has had worldwide influence, both in Revelation 19 to 20, but rather, but in Revelation 19 to 20, John described how the Antichrist and the beast and the false prophet are destroyed. Satan is bound for a thousand years, and the Lord Jesus will establish his kingdom upon this earth. And as Isaiah said this morning, his kingdom, there shall be no end. Matthew 24, pick up verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, there you go, and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other, those are the bodies of those who received Jesus Christ. Now, Matthew said, listen, there's going to be a sign in the sky. He didn't tell us what that sign was. been a lot of speculation, but here's what I think. I believe it's going to be nothing less than the Shekinah glory of God glowing against the backdrop of the darkness of this world. Listen to me carefully as we close. The stars will have fallen. The sun and the moon will no longer be giving their light. But like the rays of the sun streaming out from behind the cloud, I'm telling you, every time I see that, I will say, Lord, is this it? Is that you coming? It's going to be like those sun rays streaming from behind the clouds. The glory of the Lord is going to precede the Lord himself. And that Shekinah glory burst forth. Jesus re-enters this universe, but this time as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And even though he's going to be in his glorified body, those who see him will recognize him as the Lord Jesus Christ, who has returned to this earth. Beloved, please try to picture this in your mind. Just close everything out, but picture this for a second. This, by this time, the whole world is going to be in a panic. Listen to me carefully. Many people will be dying of nothing but terror. There will be people crying out for the rocks to fall upon them because they don't want to live anymore. The earth is in total darkness. The warmth of the sun is gone. So they will be cold. They will be hungry. They will be helpless. They will be without hope. 
they will be the, they were never hope of anything being any different than it is right there they are hopeless then all of a sudden in the midst of this blackness no stars no sun no moon that, that's where the bible says you'll neither know day nor night you will know what day it is because you don't know the day from the night it's always dark and then all of a sudden in the midst of this darkness burst forth a bright light and it gets larger and larger and brighter and brighter and the people cry out in fear because they don't know what's happening here but beloved this is the revelation this is the revelation of the light of the world, the glorified Son of Man, the unveiled majesty of the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and His revelation is preceded by the brightness of the Shekinah glory. Then all of a sudden, riding on the clouds as if there were a chariot, here comes Jesus Christ, and He's revealed as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He makes several circles around the earth in order that every eye should see Him. This is the day of the Lord. This is the day when God personally intervenes in human history again to bring this age to a close by destroying those who rebelled against Him and destroying those who refused to receive Him as their Savior and rewarding those who did believe in Him and rewarding those who did receive Him as their Savior. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground, for He comes to make His blessings flow far as the curse is found. A renewed earth, a renewed earth, just as it was in the beginning. You say, Pastor, will we be there to see it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But we'll not see it from here. We'll see it from there. We'll see it from the porch of heaven. In Colossians 3, 4, verse 4, the Apostle Paul said this, When Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory read it for yourself if colossians 3 4 we will appear with him in glory you see having escaped the wrath of god by receiving jesus christ as our savior and lord we will be coming with the earth to the earth with the lord to rule and reign with him for a thousand years so yes we'll be there but we will be looking down upon all that's happening rather than looking up to see what's happening but once the lord jesus christ destroys those who opposed him just with the sword of his mouth, one word and it's over. He sends them on their eternal destiny. Jesus will establish his new kingdom upon the earth right there in Jerusalem. And he will rule the world with truth and grace and make the nations prove the glory of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. And when he touches down back there on the Mount of Olives from which he ascended 2,000 years ago, the whole earth will be changed back into the Garden of Eden. Now notice very quickly several things. I'm not going to put a lot of time here, but just mention it to you. On the back of your order service, or back of your study guide there, he mentions three things, warnings. Number one, the parable of the fig tree. The parable of the fig tree is Israel. He said, when you see the fig tree budding again, know that summer's not. Well, what's the fig? The budding of the fig tree is 1948. That was the budding. 1967 was an additional budding. Why? Because they, were, they now controlled Jerusalem. That's the budding of the fig tree. And Jesus said that the generation that saw that would also see the Son of Man coming. Now, I can't figure that out, but that's what the Bible says. Number two, look at the example of Noah's day. He said, as it was in Noah's day, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. What does that mean? Well, according to Genesis 6, 1 through 5, uh, uh, Noah's day was marked by unrestrained violence, demonic oppression, and unlimited sexual expression, deviation, just as we see in our culture today. And even though they watched that ark being built for 120 years, and even though Noah preached his heart out for 120 years, it was que sera, sera, that is, until that first clap of thunder and that first drop of rain, which they had never seen before, that it had not had rain before until that day. Finally, look in verse 45 and 50. You see the faithful and evil servant. He said, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Beloved, let me ask you, what are you today? And I'm a man, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a father, grandfather, I'm a neighbor, I'm a friend, I'm a member of the church. What are you today, ma'am? I'm a woman, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a friend, I'm a worker, whatever. Okay, are you faithful to that? Part of it is being faithful to this church. By the way, Hebrews says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That's what it means. We kind of overlook that. We say, oh, well, I guess that's in there, but yeah, I don't know. No, it says, forsake not. It doesn't, it doesn't give an excuse. It says forsake not. And that's, I, I, I'm not trying to 
step on your toes. I'm simply saying that's what the Bible says. You have to deal with the scriptures, not with me. Beloved, one more time, let me make this clear to you. Get your house in order. Get your heart in order. Get your house in order. Get your home in order. Why? Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your Holy Spirit that will guide us into all truth. Take, Father, these mumbling words today uh, of your humble servant, and Lord just, Lord, just make them truth and wisdom and honor and glory, first of all, to your name, but to the people who came here to hear from you. And Lord, having heard, now heard from you, they must respond to you. Not to me, not to a song, not to a church. Their response is to the Holy Spirit who's speaking to the heart right now. Father, have your will and your way in every heart, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand together?